Yeah. Right. So we've got a destination that we want to get to. And then we kind of find the the path of the most resistance, maybe it, it is, versus going paid. We're looking to do as much on dirt as we can to get to where we want to go. Are you into four-wheeling camping and exploring? How about off-road racing like mud bogs, short course wheel-to-wheel racing, or even desert races? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to 4 Before Canada podcast. My name is Wes, and I've been four-wheeling since I was six weeks old. I have over 20 years' experience in 4 by 4 shops, many more than that in the off-road racing, and a lifetime of exploring the backcountry across Canada. Every week, we bring you a new guest where they give you their perspective on the industry. We discuss everything from four-wheeling, overlanding, every form of off-road racing across this great country, as well as we talk to many Canadian manufacturers and 4x4 shops. Just a quick reminder that if you're looking for more episodes, you can find all of our episodes on 4 before canada podcastcom or your favorite podcast sharing platform. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at 4 before canada podcastcom Now let's get to the show. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 4 by 4 Canada podcast. I'm your host, Trisha. And I'm your host, Wes. And, and I'm Mike from... Okanagan Overlanding. Awesome. Really glad to have you here, Mike. You got a great little Jeep. I love your Instagram channel. You, you got a lot of stuff going on and we'll get into your Jeep and all the different additions lately in a few minutes here. But before we get into that, Trisha went to her first Overland event in Ontario last weekend, the Overland North Albion Hills meet. How was that, Trisha? It was fantastic. <laughs> it's amazing. Definitely an eye opener to a, just a completely different community and yep. uh, just appreciation of like different vehicles, you know, not just like going to my meets and just seeing Jeeps, you're seeing trucks, you're seeing Land Rovers, you're seeing the odd Subaru <laughs> or like Lexus or Forerunners. So that was really cool to see as well. But I did go for the weekend. I didn't camp. Unfortunately, I will next time for sure. But I did do the, the days and there was a lot of vendors there. There was a lot of walking, a lot of walking around and looking at the rigs. And I got to experience something really cool that the first time they did this year was called the driver's experience. So what they had was a little obstacle course that they had people go on groups during up the day throughout the weekend. So I was able to experience that. So that was totally awesome for about three hours. And, and that was led by Overland Canada training, wasn't it? Training, or- yeah. Yeah, Chris, and then of course Richard from Freedom Recovery Gear as well, yes. helping helping them out. So heard lots of great things about them, and I definitely mm-hmm. want to get them on the show as well too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but, so um, definitely have to watch that podcast when it comes out, guys, because it was totally awesome and definitely eye opener. And I'm excited; I might get pulled into the whole. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's see. <laughs> so Tr- Trisha did a really great video that if you guys go to our YouTube channel at Four Before Canada Podcast on YouTube, she did a great video. It'll be released by the time this podcast is released. And uh, she did a great walk around. She did some interviews with some of the uh, vendors who we've had on here in the past. You know, Mike from Red, I keep calling Red Beer, Red Bear Outdoors in Toronto and mm-hmm. uh, Strike Force 67 with their, their different things that they've got. And so some really great interviews, but also some really good walk around rigs. So check out our YouTube channel at 404 Canada podcast. And you can see her trying to do the teeter totter her first time on the teeter totter. <laughs> and you also up. picked up, you, you also picked up a bag, a trash bag or you know, lack of better terms, trash roof from Strike 467. Now in the previous episode, we talked with Mike with his big red forerunner about what, three weeks ago, something like that. And he's discovered that his girlfriend actually can fit in there. So we've started okay. calling it the body bag, right? Yeah, so we're like, body. it's a great way for, you know, if you want to take bodies out to the bush and get rid of them without getting inside of your forerunner all bloody, you know, this is a perfect thing. So you actually picked one of those up, didn't you? So I did. Yes, I did. So apparently this is also the like the largest tire carrier bag on the market right now. It's massive. It's huge. So I did pick one up. It's great. I have yet to use it, but I'm going to use it. It's just going to be, it's just, it just saves me room. It's going to save me room in my Jeep. It's going to, you know, haul my wood and my recovery gear, my dirt bike gear. Yep. It's just going to have everything at, at my fingertips. So I'm excited. We actually, 
he actually made exactly. a really good point about it because one thing I hadn't thought about, like they rate it so big, so because they have the tailgater tables, so the ones that go onto right. your wheels, right? Right. And they they right. made that to store those. And but he actually made a really good point about putting camping chairs in there, and because mm. I've got one of those great big Costco sized camping chairs, right. and it always takes up so much room. So that's a perfect oh, place right. to put that, yeah. right? Yeah. So cool. So you go into the next one in September. The next one is September, the rally in Muskoka yeah. in the fall. So that'd be nice. It'd be nice that it's, hopefully there's no fire ban because we did have a fire ban over that weekend. So yeah. the campers didn't wasn't able to do that. So that was something that was everyone was missing. So hopefully <laughs> in the fall. What about the winter one? You're going to do the February one and stay over? Well, no. no. But, but I know that you camp in the winter time. A little bit, don't this, you? This year was the first year. So December, I went out and did my first winter camping. Yeah. Testing out a diesel heater for Calvin at 97 Customs. Yep. Not diesel heater, propane, Propex heater. Actually. Okay. I have yep. my own diesel one, but I was kind of offered to go out and test that. And then out minus 15 Celsius. Oh, but inside my tent, it was plus 10. So you just don't want to get out. You don't want to yeah, get out. <laughs> that, that's what I don't get. Like I, I've talked to Ryan Van Veen a lot about it. You know, he's mm-hmm. great into the winter camping and we've talked on the podcast in the past as well as on text and, and that. And I'm like, it's great. That's great. You know, and he doesn't even have a heater. No, he, no. Yeah. But he he's just like, yeah, I just bundle up. And I'm like, yeah, but eventually you got to go outside or you, you have to get changed or you have to, you know, Get go put do, your boots on or whatever. Do right? dishes. Yeah, do <laughs> dishes exactly. <laughs> right, like but, try. You're all bundled up and it's cold, and you've got to wash your fry pan. So yeah, it, shop, it, shop towel, and it goes in the trasher room. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> just a real quick. Yep. You know, when you get home. Yeah, and then you can always clean it when you get home properly if you want to. Right. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, well. So. Once again, we're we're talking to Mike from Okanagan Overlanding. Let's get the socials out of the way. We'll mention them in the show notes and at the end of the show again. But where can people find you? My main kind of social is Instagram and it's Okanagan Overlanding. I'm also on Facebook, same tag for all of them. And I do have a YouTube channel, which is also Okanagan Overlanding, but I haven't really been that active on it. Most of everything I do is Instagram right now. Yeah. Yeah. So... I was actually going to ask you this later on, but we, since we're talking about Instagram, we must as well hop into it. What is it with Instagram do you find that's most appealing for you in regards to not maybe not doing the YouTube stuff or, or doing it on Facebook, but you have a real strong presence on Instagram. And there's a very strong presence in overlanding in general on Instagram. What appeals to you versus other social medias? I think it's the speed that you can actually create your presence. YouTube, I enjoy making the videos. It's mm. just such a long process. And I, I give props to the guys like Sean and Casey that are doing a video every week <laughs> and doing this full time. And if for anyone that thinks they're out there, you know, living the life and it's a whole lot of fun for every two days of exploring they do, it's probably four or five days of editing and mm-hmm. figuring out, you know, they, they, I mean, it's all about getting subscribers and views. So I enjoy doing it. I have a lot of video that I could still do. It's finding the time to edit. So with Instagram, you're kind of getting that with short reels. You can kind of, you can take videos when you're out, keeping in mind what you might want to use them for. And then you see somebody using an audio that you think, oh, that would go good with some videos I took last week when I was out in the trail. It's just kind of just, it's a little easier. That's pretty much the main reason why I focused on it. I mean, I didn't start Instagram to be about my Jeep and overlanding. My first picture was of like a coffee at a coffee shop (laughs) in Vancouver. (laughs) And that's what Instagram was. And now it's turned into this massive machine. And some people use it for, you know, it's just a place to document your, you know, what you're doing, your adventure, your life, your kids, whatever it might be. And then for many others, it's a business. And I'm kind of somewhere in between, I think. It's not a business, but it kind of leans towards it a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think, like, Trisha, you mentioned off air how much you enjoyed making that video about the Overland North event. But, oh, my God, the time it takes to do it, you said. (laughs) And it's true. Like, yeah, you're right. The videos and just the time and the editing. But, you know, it's 
social media, Instagram, it's something that you can throw up quickly. You know, you can post a story, here I am, or this is what I'm doing. And, you know, down the road, you can like, I have a full video of like, you know, off-roading or at an event. So it does take time, but it's definitely something yeah. that's fun. It's rewarding at the end of it and seeing all the different rigs on Instagram and, you know, following and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun for sure. One thing I'm just getting into the Instagram thing, especially with the podcast channel, which on Instagram to check us out for, for Canada podcast. <laughs> but one thing I'm getting used to is doing more reels. And I was just posted mm-hmm. photos before, whether it be on my personal one or on, on the podcast one. And, you know, uh, I'm trying, you know, Terry Ann actually got me onto that. She explores off road. She's like, you got to do reels. You got to do reels. And I'm like, I don't want to do reels, but now I'm I'm doing them. And I'm also, it's a funny Mike from the Unexpected Off-Road. Him and I were up at Cornwall a couple weeks ago. And we're doing these videos. We're doing them vertical. And we turn the, the camera sideways to do them the other way. So we're doing like yeah. one, one for Instagram and then one yeah. for YouTube. It's, it's, it's get, getting used to it all, right? So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And reels, I mean, everything pushed towards reels and and it's funny, the, the frustrating part about Instagram is when you think you've got to figure it out. So I've had <laughs> some really successful reels, right? They're, yeah. I would call them not necessarily the most serious ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I had one that was over 3 million plays. And nice. that's, that's when I took off. Like that yeah. one, my, my followers took off. But to try and replicate that, I'm happy now if I hit 4,000. It's they change the algorithms and I you can't keep up with it. So now I just post it because I want to post it. Yeah, and I think buddies out there that like it. Yeah, yeah, that's the way you got to do it, right? If you like it and enjoy it, and just post what you like, and like you say, it's a good way to document as well, too, right? So Mm -hmm. you know, twenty years down the road, you can go back and look at these, and if you want to. It's, it's like, I won't, I don't want to listen to my first podcast, but I do want to listen to my first podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, the funny thing is I still have 30,000 photos on my phone. So still on there, it's eat them, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're in the- Bouncing back into the Okanagan overlanding, you got a red Rubicon GLU, which we'll get into shortly, but we want to learn a little bit more about you and how Orco, Orco, Okanagan <laughs> overland <laughs> was born. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the o- North Okanagan in British Columbia, and uh, Vernon has become a little hotbed for overlanding people. You know, we've already interviewed Mike from the Unexpected Off Road, Ryan Van Deen. There's a bunch of other people from Vernon, you know, Sky. There's probably two or three more others I can think of, and then there's probably another three or four I can think of right in North Okanagan. So, what is it, do you think, with the Okanagan area or the Vernon area that has made it so popular? I think. You know, the, the Okanagan in general is, it's a off-roading hotbed because within, you know, I can leave here and in 20 minutes be on dirt and go out and spend four hours exploring and be back for mid-afternoon to clean a bathroom on the weekend or something like that, right? <laughs> and then on top of that, whether it's just going out wheeling or getting out there and exploring, which is kind of what I do and my buddies and, and my friends my family, more my wife. Now the kids are kind of, you know, not, not looking at it as much as they used to. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's so many lakes, so many yeah. places that you can go that are so close. And the only thing that stops us is snow or forest fires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's winter and you, you can only get so far out. And then in the summer, we just cross our fingers that, you know, right now we've got, we've had rain for a few days, so it's been good. Fire bands are off and you don't feel like you're risking the forest by going out and exploring and mm-hmm. you know, accidentally setting off a spark or something like that, that you don't even know happened. So yeah. it's just, there's so, there's so much around mm-hmm. here and people are moving here. Right. So I yeah. think that's part of the reason why there's, you know, the overlanding community here is, is growing. Just there's more people coming from Alberta. There's more people coming up from, from the lower mainland and it's just contributing to that. I don't, I can, the amount of rooftop tents you see, not that that makes you an overlander. Uh, I don't want to talk about that probably, but it's, there's, there, you know, there's a lot of rooftop tents out there. Everything yeah. from cross treks to, you know, full size Ram trucks with rooftop tents. And so everyone's getting out as much as they can, which is good. Yeah. And I think it really sort of boomed with the pandemic, helping everyone to get out and get out and explore, right? So did you grow up in an outdoors family or is camping and, 
formerly in something that came later in life or was it there all the time or how did that come to be? So we've always camped. I, I was born in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and there wasn't a lot of places like what we have here to go camping, but we used to go to, I remember going to Buffalo Pound in our little bowler trailer. That's what I remember as a kid. And when we moved to Vancouver Island, we still were camping, always actual campgrounds, never wild camping. That didn't come until kind of in my late teens, early 20s, going to rec sites and, and stuff like that. And then that's kind of when I started wheeling as well. My first mm -hmm. off-road truck was uh, an 85 Toyota truck. Mm -hmm. And then I had 1990 Nissan hard body. And that was just going out and trying to climb the biggest hill and just get from point A to point B and find the most difficult way to get there. So kind of the, you know, the old way of wheeling and, yep. and I guess still today. So I never combined the two back then. And, and now it's kind of, it's gone that way. I, my first Jeep was a 2014 JK and that's when I moved up to the Okanagan and because we're girl, my current wife, you know, that's why I'm up here. And, and she has three kids and, you know, we started just camping in the Jeep and taking them yeah. to the provincial parks. And then yeah. it's so hard to get in the provincial parks in BC. We got to be planning like three and four months ahead on exactly what you're doing on what weekend. So then we picked up a little off-road trailer. It's called, it was a Taxa Outdoor Woolly Bear. So I had a rooftop tent on and that oh. was our first kind of, you know, we had a little Tapui tent on it. And so we had a ground tent, we had the rooftop tent and it just allowed us to, it had a kind of a galley in one side. It allowed us to have everything ready to go. It was just throwing mm -hmm. food in, mm -hmm. throwing our clothes in and we could go. So now we started heading out to Mabel Lake and the wreck sites along Mabel Lake and getting the, the girls more and more less worried about the bugs and more out there enjoying <laughs> being camping. And it yeah. just kind of evolved from that. I was taking the, right. you know, I got my JL and I was taking the tent off the trailer and putting it onto the Jeep to go out just myself or my wife and I. And then when the kids are here, we put it back on the trailer and we go out. So it was just kind of that back and forth. And, right. and then, you know, eventually we end up with another rooftop tent. <laughs> so we didn't have to do that. <laughs> so let, let's talk about your current Jeep. I know Trisha loves it because it's red. It's, it's a yeah. great looking Jeep. <laughs> yeah. uh, but You've got quite a few modifications on there. Let's let's work on that from the say the front to the back. The front to the back. Well, <laughs> I mean, I've got it's it's a JL Rubicon, JLU Rubicon. So it and I ordered it from the factory. So it does have the steel front and rear bumper. So it I've got a Warren 10S winch in the actual stock bumper because it works. It looks good. Yeah. I like it. I put in a it a two inch Mopar lift with a Fox shocks originally, it mm -hmm. actually gave me three and a quarter inches of lift and it's never <laughs> settled below three. So I feel yeah. like I got bonus on my two inch oh. lift and I've run that for essentially, you know, almost five years. And I just changed the shocks out to the TerraFlex Falcon 3.3 adjustables, which is <laughs> just night and day <laughs> let's let's talk about that for a sec what do you think yeah. of those i haven't been in the vehicle with them so i'll have to go for a ride with you one day it, it out <laughs> yeah the adjustability it takes a little yeah. to get figured so out you've got you've got one setting that is soft and then you've got one you know a third setting that is stiffer yeah so highway driving you don't get the roll like i mean i'm, I'm a little top heavy and so going around corners and that you do get that roll and when you put it on the stiff setting most of that roll is gone. Wow. It's amazing. And then the second setting is adjustable. So you can customize it. You have settings one through eight with four kind of being medium. One would be the same as the permanent soft setting and eight being the high setting. So right now I'm driving around town with it on kind of medium four just to see. I'm, I might soften it to a three just because, you, you know, our roads are not that great around here. So <laughs> it feels like you're off-roading when you're driving through town <laughs> just to soak up a little bit of, of those bumps. But from that standpoint, I mean, I, we're going on a big trip starting July 1st, so it'll get a good 10 days off-road straight. Nice. So I'll be able to play with it some more and be just figure it out. Yeah. yeah. When you listen to the guys at Epic down in Surrey, I mean, they, they live and die by the Terraflex 3.3s and now they've got the remote, you know, you can change them from within inside the, the vehicle. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Just apparently they hold up well in our winters. The Fox shocks were amazing. Like for bang for your buck, the 2.0s monotube, they were great. They're great. They're just starting to lose their, <laughs> their, uh, what they're, what they do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, their absorption. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're aging out. Yeah, exactly. So why not go to something that's adjustable? And <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I did do, and I'm kind of starting from the bottom, working my yep. way up, I guess. I also went with a Terraflex heavy duty diff covers front and back again, night and day. When you see how thin the stock ones are compared to these cast ones, it's, it's crazy. Then I've just in the last week changed out my rims. I just sold today. Actually my, I used to have the fuel beast rims. I had them on my 2014. So I've had them for God, don't mm. like nine years. So I just went to the Terraflex. There's a theme here. The Terra, <laughs> the Terraflex Nomad off-road rims and then put 35 by 12 and a half Maxis Razor ATs, mm-hmm. which I never really, I mean, I have a mountain bike and I got Maxis on them, mm-hmm. but never really looked at them for the Jeep before and had some good conversations with our, our guy, Jerry down at Tireland and He's like all of, all about them right now. Did my reviews, research, and all that, and they're nice. They're quiet. They're soft. The ride is softer, and that's partly I went to a 17 inch rim from an 18, so that extra sidewall is it just feels good. That went to shocks, mm-hmm. yeah, and dialed in yeah. pretty good. The best part about these rims is it's got a deflator system. So that's you, what I was going to ask you, you about. You basically just walk to the wheel and you undo it, do like three turns, and walk around and do all four and by the time you get back to the first one i'm down 17 psi no it's like literally like pulling the stem the valve stem out with like your yeah. arb deflator system yeah except there's no valve stem it's a plug with a ball oh. valve in it and you adjust the ball valve before you go out on the trail to what psi you'd like yeah then you have your regular valve stem which is in a cover so it doesn't get damaged as well and that's i mean that's I just set them the other day. I think it was Sunday. I set them to their settings so I can go up and give them a try. And I did them all. And yeah, it takes a bit longer to fill them up because they're bigger tires than what I had before. <laughs> but but there, it's, yeah. I, 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 I think made... that's awesome. That To me, wow. that just totally makes sense, right? I mean, <laughs> that's one of the things I, I, I hate. You, know, you talk to my friends and they know that I hate airing up and I hate airing down. But that, you just walk up to it, two, three turns, rock around, and you're done. It just... Yeah. Yeah. You're still going to air them back up. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's amazing. I used to dread, you know, you hit the, the gravel and you're hitting the washboards and you're going, oh, I should stop and air down, right? And then you're going, oh, then there's no wash. The washboards are done because you've gone around that hairpin turn and it's smooth. It's like, okay, I'll keep going. And then you hit the next washboard, the next washboard. <laughs> like now we're into it. You go, oh, I might as well air down. Yeah. It's, it just makes such a difference on your body. Like just, it's so tense. And the vehicle, all that rattling. And if you can get your tires, you know, even if it's down from 35 PSI down to 25, even 23, if you're just doing the back roads, it just softens everything. It's better for you, better for the vehicle. And you can pick up, you know, my wife's Jeep Cherokee. I've got a little compressor from Canadian Tire that it doesn't take long to to get them back up you got 35s or 37s you're going to want something with a little bit more oomph behind it but yeah what what are you using for a compressor on your on your jail yeah so i've got the arb twin compressor it's mounted in that cubby in the back yeah and then i've got from american adventure lab it's a kind of like a satellite system so the hoses all come up just next to the roll bar and then the breather valve, the breathers are there as well as the chuck and the switch. So yeah. I don't have to go in there because I got my kitchen on top of that. Well, um, yeah, it works. I, I, I made my own four tire air up, air down system, yeah. air up system now. Yeah. So I can plug all four at the same time and go drink my coffee while everyone else is down on their hands and knees. <laughs> and- <laughs> and going, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the suspension wheels I have. From a lighting perspective, I've got a diode dynamic cross link light bar. So it's eight five inch square bars, similar to the KC light bar that they they create, but mm-hmm. it, they're square instead of round. And so I, love, I love that of, setup. It's nice. I yeah, like it. it's yeah. it's nice. I, I wish it's different um, too. But it's nice to be. Yeah, I had to put my covers on because I got a little warning. <laughs> oh, did, oh. You? <laughs> did you know it's in BC? It's eighty five dollars per light. So I have eight lights up there. So, yeah. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. So all the lighting's kind of diode dynamics and what else is in there? The, one of the first things I did was actually the, the sidestep slider, which is from Rome off-road. And the JL was just out. Like I, you know, 2018 ordered from the factory. So there wasn't a lot, tons of stuff from the JK and the JL stuff was just starting to kind of trickle out. So I got mine June, 2018. So it had only been out for about eight months yeah. that it was out there. So those have been great. I've had them line X from the local shop here in town and they look new. Well, you wash them and they, they're like new again and they're five years old, no rust on them. It's kind of nice. It's they nice. hold up well to the, the rocks and stuff. Want me to keep going? You bet, yeah. <laughs> I've got, obviously the, the thing that stands out the most is probably the, the tent and the awning. So I've got a wedge tent, which is from Quick Pitch. Uh, Quick Pitch is a South African company. I have a a good friend. His name's Aubrey. He's in Red Deer and he has a company called Gear for Overland and he imports in all, he's from South Africa. So he imports in all this product, front runner product, quick pitch being kind of his first, the first products that he's bringing in. I know he's, he's dealing with iCamper now as well. So I've got the quick pitch rooftop tent, which sets up in like 30 seconds. You just push it up and then their 20 second awning which is huge and it literally takes 20 seconds to open it up it's freestanding you i've got legs on mine because i've got a wall kit but it's we've got video from one of the guys at summit he was down at the expo in flagstaff last year and it was blowing in gusts of 60 to 70 miles per hour everyone else was scrambling to put their awnings away and put their tents away and he's videoing the awnings just it's moving but it's not breaking and yeah you know, there's some things you, you kind of buy once, cry once kind of thing, and you know they're going to last. And I do chin-ups off of it. It's wow. not regularly, just to show people. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't go camping to go do chin-ups. <laughs> if somebody wants to see how strong it is, it, it really, you know, it's the difference between a $1,000 awning and a $2,000 awning. Can, yeah, see I've it. seen yours up close, right? And I've, you know, had a good look at it. And you can see the quality of it. It's just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, both that and... At the Vernon meet, there's a lot of quick pitch products there and yeah. all the, everything was just quality, right? So, you know, definitely a shout out to, to my gear for Overland because they bring in some really neat products lately for sure. Yeah. I do yeah. want to get him on the podcast as well. Too. That would be a great idea. Yeah. 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 Moving to the back mm-hmm. or actually to the inside. Let's mm-hmm. talk about that little uh, slide out kitchen you got. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to make room for that. So it's a quick pitch kitchen. It's. It's their two oh, point. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's quick pitch as well. So okay. I'm all in with with gear for Orlando <laughs> quick pitch right now. It's uh, it's actually this their second version, and it just gives you more table space. So basically, you've got in the space that you're sixty percent side of the back seats, it tucks in where your sixty percent seat would be. You'd have to remove mm-hmm. your sixty percent seat. So I've done yeah. a full seat delete in the back. I'm going to mm-hmm. add in a forty percent back in once summer's over. And but it does take up a big amount of space. But I've got a fifty six liter dual fridge in there, Snowmaster dual fridge. So when you pull it out, the drawer, the fridge drops down, down to a height that you can see in it, as well as now you've got this kitchen workspace. All your dishes and cutlery and everything all your your junk drawer from your kitchen you can duplicate that because you've got that same kind of drawer and some workspace that you can set up your stove and it's it makes just kind of stopping on the side of the trail to make lunch make a coffee uh, mm-hmm. or when you get to camp it's just quick it's organized and as much space as it takes it's actually efficient mm-hmm. i find it efficient not easy to take in and out. I but imagine you might keep it in, in there most of the time, don't you? Yeah, I took it out for Christmas last year because right. we went down to visit and I put the seats back in. And it's two people for sure. I did yeah. it by myself, but I probably shouldn't have. But it's it's twenty. I got 20 bolts and T-nuts holding it in. So wow. I put in my own three-quarter inch subfloor as well as my the platform to delete the seats. So it's all flat in there and carpeted yeah. and Dogs it's like pretty cool. Fun. I have to admit, I really like. It. I love the, the the fridge drop down. That that's great. I've got the fridge in behind my driver's seat on the Tacoma, mm-hmm. and to get into the back, I gotta reach up my tippy yeah. toes to yeah. get in the back. And the idea of the fridge being able to come out and drop down 
I just love it. Mm-hmm. Like, like you say, it, it's a really a good use of space. I didn't realize it was actually a quick pitch product. So mm-hmm. kudos yeah. to them because, yeah. you know, it is a neat, neat design for sure. It, so anyone who sees it, as soon as the, we did, I went to a car show and put the Jeep in the car show. And I tell you that you know, all the guys are at the car, the, the guys with their classic cars are sitting in their lawn chairs, eating their food truck stuff. And there's like 30 people standing around the Jeep asking questions. And I'm like, when do I get to sit down and eat my food truck stuff? Uh, it's just, they, you know, I think people see these things on top of the vehicles driving around, but they don't necessarily know what it is. And to see it opened up and the big awning and then pull that kitchen out. I mean, there's people like, oh my God, like we need this. They're like 70 years old and they're, we need this on our forerunner. It's like, okay. And actually we had it, that meet and greet. We had a couple that were picking up their forerunner the Monday afterwards and they came in and they must've spent three hours walking around, looking at everybody's vehicles to try nice. to get ideas of, cause they wanted yeah. to go out and, and do some fun exploring. In the yeah. Oregon. yeah, exactly. And that's pretty much a think about it for vehicle wise, right? I mean, you've yeah. got, what yeah. you got in the back end, you got, you do have a different tire carrier bumper on the back, don't you? Yeah, I can't even remember which one it is. Oh, I did put a heavy duty one on there because yeah. there's just once you start putting 35s on, you need to reinforce the hinges. And there's there's electronic stuff, but that's 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 any anything that anybody would care about. I'm guessing. <laughs> I have a full power system in there, so it's that would probably be the only other big thing. So I have a on top of the rooftop tent is a 370 watt solar panel connected to. So when you look at your roll bar. On the window on the kitchen side attached to the rhino rack backbone system i actually have a, a, a electrical panel there with my dc to dc charger my solar Ooh. controller my we boost and so that solar panel has been keeping my fridge running and my battery 100 amp hour lithium battery running mm-hmm. well i think it was when we were at that overland meet that was six weeks at that point so we're now on to nine weeks that it's been running haven't had to ever even think about it so my yeah. fridge is on it'll be on until i'm done camping or until it's no. cold and i don't need it <laughs> that's perfect I, yeah i've been thinking about doing something as well with the fridge but yeah there's other projects coming up and of course everyone wants to know what did you name your jeep <laughs> my jeep yeah because every jeep has to have a name right every jeep has to have yeah. a name <laughs> yeah so it's funny because i went through a bunch of different ideas and it just yeah. at the end of the day this made sense so my last name is buell okay and I grew up in the eighties when Ferris <laughs> okay. Bueller, when Ferris Bueller yeah. came. So yeah. I remember, you know, the weekend the movie came out, and everyone had to go to the theater to see it back then. But yeah. I can't remember what year it was. But when I went to rugby practice the next day, the coach started calling me Bueller. So <laughs> and that stuck. So Bueller <laughs> stuck. And then, you know, next generation, my two sons, hockey coaching hockey. Yeah, the coaches are all my age and I'm coaching with them and they're calling my son, my oldest son, Ferris Bueller. No like, way. It just continues. Right. And, and my other son as well, getting called Bueller. So when I got the JL and, and kind of, you know, we always put that name on the hood. It was like, mm-hmm. well, and I already had the Bueller license plate oh. on my Xterra before this. And, okay. and so that kind of moved over to the Jeep and it's like, well, I just got to do Ferris. You got to so do the Jeep it. Yeah. Name is Ferris. It's funny because people will walk by on a crosswalk and they'll see the license plate. Yeah. And you see them kind of go, oh, and then they see the Ferris on the side. Yeah. And then you get the thumbs up like, <laughs> I've gone through the border and you know, the border agent's like, is it your day off today? Yeah. So it creates conversation for sure. That's awesome. I love it. That's unique. <laughs> I love how, like, I just, yeah, this learning about people, how the name came about and everyone yeah. has a different story and it's, it's like a, something has happened or stay with them. So that's awesome. I love it. I love yeah. that story. Yeah. It's fun. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Yeah. So why a Jeep? It's funny because I never had a desire to have a Jeep when I was younger. I was kind of like more about cars, right? Mm. Um, And then I don't know what it was, but there was just this, you know, seeing people with top off and all that. (laughs) And so I I got a new one in 2014, the JL Sahara, JLU Sahara, hydro blue, my favorite color. I wanted that when I got the new one, but they didn't have hydro blue then. (laughs) And we wouldn't have been as friendly as we are because we did, I would have had hydro blue but it was you know just I remember driving down the Oregon coast and you get the top off and driving on the beach with the top off and it's just there's something about it and then you can drive with the top off and be up 
the trail and getting covered in dust and, you know, cursing later on when you got to clean it all, but you just had all, all worries are gone when yeah. you're out and experiencing that. So it's kind of like having a sports car that you can go anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. Just not fast. You can go anywhere. <laughs> you could go fast. I mean, <laughs> and you, the JL, I mean, for the first two years before I started putting the tent up on top, um, mm-hmm. even when I had my Rhino rack platform on it, I was still taking the top off and putting it on. Like it was like not a off for the summer. It's kind of what we were doing, whether the top was on or not. And I, I do miss that part of it. Cause I don't take it off now. Mm-hmm. I need a shop with a lift to keep doing, it. I can't get into my garage and that kind of thing. So yeah. I need Aubrey's new shop and red deer. It's that's kind of, you know, really what it is. It's just, it's fun to drive. A lot of people complain about driving a Jeep, how you're kind of, you know, you're constantly turning the steering wheel and I look at it as it's, well, I have to be driving it. I can't just you know, fall asleep and <laughs> you physically have to drive it and yeah. it's fun. I go for a drive every day. I work from home when I'm not on the road and yeah. three o'clock, I'm like going to get Nancy. I need to get out for a 20 minute drive. So I'll go take a bomb in the Jeep, refresh myself, yeah. come back and, yeah. and do another hour of work when I get back. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much why. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Jeep, of course. <laughs> it's a Jeep thing. <laughs> it's a Jeep thing. So let's say Jeeps weren't available. What would you choose for an overlanding rig? Say there's, you know, a re- they, 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 they worked on the earth or you were not allowed for some reason to have a Jeep. What, what would vehicle would you choose for overlanding? That's a really good question because today there's so many uh-huh. vehicles that people have adapted. And, you know, when you look at the, like the Lexus gx 460 470 and you see you know what people have done with those pretty cool but i would say the one thing that i missed the most would be the wave right do you guys have mm-hmm. a tacoma wave trying to it's usually a middle finger going? it i probably would look for a land cruiser mm-hmm. there's just something about the land and even if i had the means and had the space i wouldn't mind the land cruiser at some point to build up there's just something about that iconic you know, overland world. I, I've looked at defenders and all that kind of stuff. And I just don't want to go down that, that path because <laughs> you spend a lot of money, but not for stuff to, to use camping. It's just yeah. running. And then the only, the other one that I thought about would be the new Rivian SUV. Yeah. I like the idea of having everything inside and dust proof mm-hmm. without having to put a canopy and all that on. So that intrigues me. There's, there was a show with Ewan McGregor where they did from Argentina up to LA and they, oh, did, yeah. it on, they did it on electric Harley Davidson's prototype yeah. Harley Davidson's and Rivian provided before Rivian was even available, provided the, the support vehicles yeah. and set up charging stations along the way and just seeing, and these things weren't even done. There was like wires in the dash and <laughs> not even close toggle switches and to see what they could do. And, and then now that they're out and I see them driving around now, that would be an interesting one to give a try. Yeah, they definitely interest me. I mean, when they, I guess a year or two ago, they did a thing where they invited a bunch of media people to an event in Colorado. And they went up over some of these mountain passes and that. Mm-hmm. And it was actually quite impressive, so especially, you know, there's an electric motor for each wheel. Yeah. And so you, it's almost like being locked. You're, you know, it'll sense which one's slipping and yeah. send it to the other one. And it's basically like be say being locked front and rear. And I, I was quite impressed with them and in the stock form mm-hmm. how they did. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I th- what, I think, what about you, Trisha? Yeah. That's a good question because <laughs> you know, I was, I'm in the same boat. I never thought I would own a Jeep. I like Jeeps, but I didn't actively look for a Jeep at all before I was kind of into like more, I guess, luxury. Like I was actually going to get like a, you know, go German car and go Audi or something before I I, like, it was either that or the Jeep at one point until I went to the Jeep. So for me now being in the four by four community, if I was to probably go, I would say that the FJ cruiser, I think I would go with the cruiser. Yeah. 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 They're an interesting little vehicle for sure. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Body yeah. kind of, yeah. Hopefully they bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> kind I've of a heard retro, that retro bringing, look. They are bringing the Land Cruiser back. We just don't know what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I 
was, you know, checking out the counts. But so you went to Iceland, looks like earlier in the year. Yeah, oh. I went in March. Um, oh, you went in March. Was, so I was going there for work. Okay. Um, I know for me, the company that I, Hunter Douglas, that I work for, we, we have incentive trips for our customers, our retailers, they hit targets, they go on these trips. And the trip this year was, one of the trips was Iceland. So the mm. first four days was doing stuff with my customers and exploring around okay. more closer to Reykjavik. Okay. And then I extended and okay. stayed an extra six days and rented myself a little all wheel drive Volkswagen caddy, which is basically like those little Amazon delivery guy cars. Vans. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> it's all wheel drive. It had like, you know, kind of cool rims on it and tire mounted on the ladder on the back. And yeah, in the back, it had a couch that flipped down to a bed, a diesel heater plumbed into, cause everything's diesel over there. Okay. Diesel heater hooked up. Yeah. And uh, sink water, little one burner stove and i spent six days exploring kind of wow. the southern parts of iceland yeah it's an amazing amazing place it looks amazing it's like if it's not it's on these... your bucket list yeah if it's on it, your bucket you, list yeah yeah something's if you wrong, love the but... outdoors <laughs> yeah if, yeah and some of the vehicles there i mean you want to see tidal land cruisers they're like a dime yeah. a dozen there but they're on 50 54 inch tires they're like come on you know, 20 inches wide because so they have their kind of back roads are called f roads and okay. you can't go on them in the winter it's kind of the outback in australia in iceland they have the highlands and that area you can only go on in the winter time if you have a an arctic truck with these big tires big um, tires yeah i went on one that didn't have snow on it and then once i got to a certain point i was trying to get to a glacier i had to turn around because i just by myself, you know, you got to be smart too. And I'm in a rental <laughs> vehicle <laughs> where I'm not supposed to be probably, uh, but definitely it's on the list to go back a little bit later, closer to summer to really yeah. experience it. And, and X Overland, the YouTube channel X Overland, they just did their Nordic trip and spent three weeks in Iceland, got mm -hmm. to see all of everything that I would love to go back and see. Yeah. It's an amazing mm -hmm. place. Yeah. They have a lot of waterfalls there, don't they? Oh my God. Like, it's so you look at a drive and you go, okay, it's 300 kilometers I'm going to do today. And that's whatever, like it'll take me six hours, mm -hmm. except that you stop every mm -hmm. corner you go around. Oh, there's a waterfall. Oh, there's a, oh, there's a glacier. Oh, there's a volcano field. And, you mm -hmm. know, you're just constant stopping. And, and so you kind of just, that was a nice thing about not staying in a hotel. I could just find a camp spot. Yeah, you know, and just not go. have to worry, but I needed to be somewhere and you can kind of divert yourself. Kind of, I mean, what we want to do here yeah, right. is just kind of go where our interests take us and explore. Oh, there's a lake. Let's go look at the lake. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's something like 10,000 waterfalls. And of course things were starting to melt. So there was water falling plus the ice is still there. It's, it's impressive. I mean, you saw the Instagram, but I was going to send yeah. you a couple pictures mm -hmm. from there as well. Definitely for sure. That's awesome. What what language do they speak? Is, is there a language barrier or do they speak a lot of English there? They do have an Icelandic, you know, it goes back to the Viking age, but they pretty much all speak English. Yeah. They travel a lot. Okay. You know, there's less than 400,000 people and it's cold and dark uh, for a lot of the year. So they do travel a lot to get away <laughs> from in the winter time. Okay. And English is kind of their second language. So there was never... At no point did I have an issue with trying to communicate with someone. Understanding someone's English with an Icelandic accent, that's mm. different. But for the most mm -hmm. part, yeah, it was pretty pretty easy to communicate. Expensive there. Like gas was, so mostly diesel vehicles. So diesel was $3.30 a liter. Mm. And petrol was around the same. And at that point, I don't know what it is today, but we were about two or three cents less. So we're almost on par. So when you looked at something and it was $3 or Chrono is the, the denomination there, it, you knew that was around $3 Canadian. Yeah. So easy that way, but then everything was just that much more expensive. Right. So my question is to you then, is there, that's a place that you would definitely go back and explore. Is there somewhere in particular that you do want to go or you have gone that's, you know, kind of, you don't want to take the Jeep out or something that you want to do overlanding or just exploring different um, area. Different in general, areas. like from here. 
either. It could be like the States or here or just somewhere. I know like, you know, throw your Jeep on a, on a plane or on a ship and go to some different country. Sure. Well, we've talked about shipping them to Iceland, actually. And then really? I, I, I said, you know what, let's just rent one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, for the money that it's going to cost and the wear and tear on the vehicle, let's just rent one. But, yeah. you know, I think there's two. We're doing one of them, you know, one of the trips on July 1st. We're doing the Washington State Back Road Discovery Route, which goes from the Canadian border to the Oregon border. Mm-hmm. Oregon, it's about yeah. 750 miles off-road in six sections, and you kind of drop down into different towns like Wenatchee and Ellensburg, mm-hmm. where you can fuel up if you need it. Mm-hmm. And for something in Canada, and, and you know, I love BC, and there's so much to explore. And, you know, even with COVID, we didn't get to see as much as we'd like to. We still haven't done the Kootenays, and it's right there. But probably highest on my list would be to to go do a trip up to the territories, like into okay. the Yukon. Um, yeah, maybe. And then, you know, keep going to Alaska, but definitely a focus on on the Northwest Territories, Yukon, and exploring up there. Yeah. Truck to Yacht Truck? Yeah, get. I mean, you'd want to get to the Arctic, right? If you're gonna go, yeah. you want to go all the way. Yeah, I think for I, myself, I definitely want to go to. I would definitely want to do talk to Yaktuk and and Northern BC, but I also want to get out east into the into the Atlantic area and Newfoundland and Labrador. It's just gorgeous over there. I've been over there a few times. I'm like, just love to get off the main road and just go somewhere yeah. else. You know, we were we were talking to Jared and Andrew from. Rome Wild Overband last month and there in in Atlanta, Canada. And just the the videos that they were shooting just with the seasides and camping right against the sea. And mm-hmm. you know, I would just love to get over into PEI or especially Labrador and Newfoundland. They're definitely in the fall type. I've been into Newfoundland yeah. in the fall and it's just gorgeous. Now do they have the same type of back road system? It's they, not as good as we ours. have out west. They, they we do, just have but so much crown land out here, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not quite as good as ours, but they still have lots of areas that they can go camping and and stuff like that. So, especially more on the mainland, like on Newfoundland mm-hmm. and that. Mm-hmm. But the the islands are so small, right? They've kind of growing, but there's still still lots of areas to go. They say so. Yeah. And what about be, kind of Quebec? I guess that would be into Labrador. Yeah, up through yeah, there, the Labrador, there's tons, everywhere. especially in northern yeah. Quebec, just yeah. tons of area up there. But I've gone, I know when I lived in Toronto, we go every fall to shoot the fall colors in Quebec and Newfoundland. And it's just, I've always wanted to go back in the, in the fall time there and just do some it's exploring. Not the same here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all, all needles here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing, Trisha, I have to admit that Ontario's better at is fall colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Just stays green out here. Stays green. Yeah. No, we definitely have the night. Yeah. That's one thing that yeah. fulls fall Jeep drives and just, yeah, it's nice out here. Definitely. So in Ontario, I mean, from mm-hmm. what I've seen, like Muskoka's and that, mm-hmm. trails are tight. Mm-hmm. Like lots of, how much pinstriping do you have on your beautiful red Jeep? <laughs> <laughs> A lot. A lot. Yeah. Like, Oh, a friend would be like, hey, you have a new you have a new stripe. Oh, really? Yeah, not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> tight trails. We do have tight trails a lot. A lot. Yeah. And rocks. A and rocks. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> like our our trails are, you know, quickly, I guess, tree lined, but the brush is so I guess I would think BC would have more. I'm surprised that we would have more than more of that, but they're just really up there. Like you're yeah, there's a lot of times where like the hard top or if my soft top, I'm just, I'm always scraping like all the time, constantly, mm-hmm. constantly. There's some think, tight trails. Oh, where you're, BC, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. You see when you get down into the lower mainland and on the island where it's mm-hmm. more, you know, you're in the rainforest. Right. You, there's a lot more of that type, tight trails. Right. Yeah. The Okanagan were more high desert. Uh, there's tight trails. It's just because nobody's gone down them. Yeah. Or it's the quad guys that haven't cut or the trees yeah. back. Yeah. yeah, they only cut it back just enough for them to fit through. Yeah, to fit through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, the Okanagan, we definitely have it. Well, BC in general is just such a weird province. You know, you got the Rocky Mountains, you got the coastal mountains, you got, you know, grasslands. Both you and I, Mike, are in the grasslands yeah. area. And then you got the Alpine, you got the oceans, you got the lakes. It's just a weird, a weird province. Not a, a weird in a good way. Right. Yeah. But, 
yeah. it's it's something uh, we yeah. don't have. So <laughs> it's different wheeling. I find that the co- the Ontario wheeling is a lot like the coastal wheeling in regards to the tight trails and the rocks and the mm-hmm. you know going over the roots and stuff like that. Whereas yeah. in the interior here, we're it's more a lot more open for sure. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah. This can be a bit of a touchy subject, but everyone thinks differently about overlanding. Some people think it's a fancy name for something they've been doing for years, like myself. I've been, I guess I've been overlanding for years, <laughs> you know, since I, you know, it's probably the same with you since we're kids, right? But other people think it's only call it overlanding if you cross into another country or you go for minimal of a week or whatever. What does overlanding mean to you? It's, you know what? It, I think. The most important thing is people are getting out yeah. regardless of what they call it. Cause really it's just fancy car camping, right? <laughs> I mean, it can be in a station wagon. It can be in a, in a Subaru. Subaru. It can mm-hmm. be in an F-150. It can be in whatever vehicle gets you out and you're driving in a car and you load all your stuff up, whether it's on the roof, whether you're sleeping on the roof or you're sleeping on the ground. At the end of the day, we're all going in our cars yeah. and going camping. I think, you know, the difference for me and I use the word overlanding, you know, we have our overlanding bro team that, you know, we, <laughs> we hang out, we're doing our trip down to, down to Oregon. And it's, it's kind of to us, it's that, you know, we don't spend one night or more than one night in one spot typically. Yeah. Right. So we've got a destination that we want to get to. And then we kind of find the, the path of the most resistance. Maybe it, it is versus going paid. We're looking to do as much on dirt as we can to get to where we want to go. So we did Bella Coola. We were going to go to Moab and we ended up doing Bella Coola because of COVID. And there's stretches where you got to pop out under the highway and it's like, okay, where's the road that we can get back on to get back to the bush. And so whether it's a weekend, whether it's 10 days, whether it's a year, because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are doing, you know, that's how they live, whatever you want to call it. You know, I call it overlanding because it's not about the gear. We got lots of gear because it's fun. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> it's, it, fun. it's, you know, <laughs> I see people online getting annoyed about, Hey, that's not overlanding or whatever. And it's like overlanding, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. And the way yeah. I look at it to me, overlanding is more about the community. Yes, for sure. Right. The, the people yeah. that you're spending it with, that you're, you're sitting around the campfire. I mean, take for example, like Vernon, when we were out at that Vernon meetup, and that yeah. camping spot that you guys found with a campfire and we're overlooking the city of Vernon. Absolutely wonderful. We're all sitting around having a good time. There's a birthday cakes going around and, yeah. and stuff like that. That's what it's all about to me is the overlanding. You know, she, some people want to get all technical about it, but to me, it's just being with people yep. that you enjoy. Right. Yep. So exactly. Exactly. Okay, it's so. way more fun to go out car camping with some other people that want to go out car camping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. the same interests. Like you, you, you know, you look at our, our vehicles and you go, Oh my God, like there's so much stuff. Right. And it's like, but we didn't start that way. Yep. You know, we started with camping in a tent and everything in a Rubbermaid tote and the Coleman yep. stove. And it's just over time you go, well, you know what? This would be easier this way. We don't have to do it, but it makes it easier going to a jet boil. Well, it's more compact. We have Jeeps. <laughs> There's not yeah. a lot of room. It's more compact and it boils the water faster. So why not? Um, yeah. And not, not everybody can take three months off and go and do international trips. We have to pay for all this stuff. And we have families and we have homes that that's our priority. And this is, to me, it's a hobby. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I want to reset my mental state, it's get in the Jeep, go camping, even if it's one night in the winter yep. it's just that mental reset and and even that even landing. if you want to do it yourself right i mean there, there's lots of times where i will pop out for one night for camping yep. because we are so lucky that i can be camping in a half hour yeah and exactly. sometimes i just need that mindset away from people and i tend to be a bit of an introvert sometimes and i like my me time and mm-hmm. you know it uh, yeah it's just totally reset right so say somebody came up to you and they said, hey, I just picked up my first rig. It's a 92 Forerunner stock. I want to get into this overlanding thing. What would you suggest? How to get started? Where to look for people and uh, to help out him out or her out? And what do you guys do modifications for the vehicle or and or camping gear? Yeah, I mean, first, I, first thing I would say is ask your friends if they got any extra camping gear. 
I've got a shelf of it because we sleep in a rooftop tent now. So <laughs> there's a lot of used camping gear out there. Again, yeah. you don't, it's not about kidding out your rig to get out, start somewhere. And the best way to start is to pick a place on the map and, and go, you know, figure out water and fuel. Yeah, That's it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a cooler just because everyone's got fridges now. doesn't mean you have to have a fridge. Yeah. It's do minimalist to start. And it's from, from a rig and what you'd want to do with the rig. I would keep it simple and it's tires, making sure you got a good set of tires. Nobody wants, you're out there and if you're driving something that's, you know, we know that a lot of the off-road, the four by four vehicles come with pretty tame tires that aren't. They're not really made to go out like with the, not the Rubicon, but like what the Sahara comes with or the sport, they're road tires. So Mm -hmm. that would be, if I was upgrading tires would be the first thing, even before a lift because 99% of what we see out there, most stock vehicles already have enough lift, right? And throwing a lift in does a whole lot of other things to your vehicle (laughs) that now and and you know, it's just it's one thing after another. It's the butterfly effect. You do one thing, and then these other things are going to happen. So you can go a little bit bigger tire. That's going to get you your extra lift, anyways, because you're trying to get that axle up, the diff up right. a bit higher, and that's yep. only accomplished by putting a larger tire on. So what's the largest tire you can do with the suspension you've got, and you know something that's got enough ply, like the falcon wild peaks and the bfgs i think they're 10 ply and so you know you're gonna you know chances of getting a flatter or, or next time because that's really the only risk you have at that point yeah and the only other thing i'd add to that is communications mm. Mm. whether it's you know there's so many options now between in reach and zolio is the newer one which i think was canadian wasn't it i'm not 100 sure no, i know that they have a big canadian market pre- I, i've got one myself here. Yeah. 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 They, and uh, then there's the other, the other one. I can't remember what the other one was, but there's, you know, to me, that's so if you do run into trouble, you've got somebody pre programmed in there. Like I've got, you know, the three messages that are preset that you can use with yeah. no extra fees. You know, I've got one that's everybody, including my wife, my two buddies, all's good. Next one is stuck. You know, can yeah. you come and help me? <laughs> and the other is like imminent. <laughs> you know, injured, hurt, need help, need yep. you know, call, call, you know, if I haven't pressed the SOS button, but that's probably if you're going to tires and, and making sure that when you're out there, you've got some way of communicating. Communication. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, there's a couple things I'll add to that. I mean, I, I've said it many times before, but I think the best modification that you can do to a vehicle is a full tank of gas and get out and explore, yeah. right? Like, and the big thing, I mean, there's a lot of people that go and they'll they'll do all their add-ons and might even buy their add-ons from the dealer and walk away with the twenty thousand dollars extra on the vehicle, but they don't even know how to drive the vehicle in the stock form, so they don't yeah. know their vehicle. And so mm-hmm. I always say, you know, get out in stock form, wheel it, and then you can figure out what you need, mm-hmm. you know, in regards to modifications. You know, do you actually need a lift or should you go with, you know, sliders or, you know, it's same thing goes of camping, right? You mentioned the, the used gear. When I moved back from Toronto, I I sold everything and I flew back on the plane with nothing. So for my camping gear, I went to all the secondhand stores and I picked up you know silverware and, and plates and cast iron you know stuff, dirt cheap at the, at the secondhand store. And you know mm-hmm. Facebook Marketplace is another great option for that for tents yeah. and and all that, right? So I agree a hundred percent that. And then you can figure out what you need and how to improve it. Once you have a, or even for a cheap, you know, that hundred dollar pop-up tent from Canadian Tire, and then you decide next year, hey, I want to get something better. You can move it to a better ground tent, or you can yeah. look at a, a rooftop tent or whatever, right? So Great just get out is, there and figure yeah. out what you need, mm-hmm. right? So the nice thing is that when you try something out and then you upgrade, chances are because of Facebook Marketplace, you can sell what you, the first item that you bought. Yep. Right. Yeah. Like that's so you're you're not always, you know, just because you start there doesn't mean when you if you change, you're gonna that money is wasted. You can usually get a good portion of that back if you look after yeah. it and it's in good shape. My tires today that I sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. you know and even going to you know to to the rooftop tents. I mean, I was kind of looking around the spring, poking my my face in the in the used rooftop tent market. 
before I bought my new one from Treeline. And the there was a lot of tents out there for a thousand to fifteen hundred. And people were saying, yeah, use four times kind of idea, right? And discover it wasn't for them. And yep. you know, you might have a tent that use four times or 12 times, something like that. And it won't fit in my new garage or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of options going to use. I, I have no problem buying used stuff myself. If, you know, if it's a good deal. <laughs> yep. yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we have mentioned a couple of times, the Verna meetup and maybe if you just want to give the listeners a little bit of a, an example of what we're talking about when we're talking about the Verna meetup. Mm-hmm. So, I, I have a good friend, is Aubrey. We've mentioned him from Gear for Overland. So he, up until recently, was based out of Edmonton, and his business was is fairly new. It's a couple of years old now. And I actually met him at the Alberta Outdoor Adventure Expo. You got it, <laughs> AOA. And uh, and we started chatting, and and then that's what got me into trying some of the quick pitch stuff as I was looking to upgrade on my Jeep. And there's not really a huge presence from a retail standpoint in the Okanagan. So we thought, Hey, let's do a, let's do a meet and greet. So we kind of collaborated with Calvin from 97 customs who does kind of the van life builds here in Vernon. And we used his parking lot last year and it was good. We had decent turnout, you know, probably 15, 20 rigs, good flow of traffic to the point where it was almost, we were too full, too busy. Right. And so we put it on again this year, a little bit later. It was May, beginning of May. Yeah. Seems so long ago already. (laughs) It's flying by. And we wanted to find a a larger location. So the Jeep guy and me drove up to the Toyota dealership (laughs) because Toyota doesn't have a lot of inventory. They have a lot of used inventory, but they don't have a lot of new inventory these days. They most everything that comes in is already purchased. So I talked to Oliver, who's the GM there, and their social media guru Linnea and said, Hey, what do you guys think about hosting with us this meet and greet? Explain to them kind of what we are. And one of their, one of the techs, his wife has that yellow FJ. Yeah. One of the sales guys has an off grid trailer. So the staff are excited about it. And so we kind of just about a month and a half beforehand kind of put together a plan on how we wanted to do it. And they were very supportive. Uh, moved all their used cars over to the empty spot in front of the building and gave us literally the entire used parking lot. And we just advertised on Facebook and, and on Instagram and a few posters up here and there and dropped them on people's windshields at Canadian Tire. And we had, it was a a fantastic turnout. I mean, we get a lot of the, the regulars that come out here, you know, mountains and memories. They were here last year and Matt from Exploration Overland bringing his trailer out. So we get, people coming from lower mainland from Alberta and lots of locals. And it was, I think we had, I think the last I counted, there was 26 or 27 vehicles parked on static display, like at an air show, all yep. the gear, all out, all their tents out and everything. And then just people wandering around. Like I mentioned that, that couple that were picking up their new forerunner, you know, Toyota invited them to come down because they would see all these, get all these ideas for camping. And that's kind of the purpose of it. Yep. It was driven by gear, you know, trying to get some more exposure for gear for overland, but at the same time, it's not selling anything there. It's, it's exposure. If we, if I looked at how many quick pitch awnings (laughs) were on vehicles last year (laughs) compared to this year, there was a lot more, but you could see, and I didn't even know who you were until after when we were sitting around at the campfire. But you could see the community part of it that like the interest in people that didn't really know what all of this was. And then you start talking to them about it and they're like, ah, oh, yeah, like, why am I still sleeping on the ground? And, <laughs> you know, go up in the tent, like get up there so they get to try it. They ask questions. So it was, it's fun. Like I'm in my element. Um, you know, I don't do this for a living, but man, if I could, <laughs> it's fun. It's just talking about stuff that you're passionate about to people yep. who are equally as passionate or interested in learning about it. It's like I could do it all day, every day. Yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned that couple. <laughs> you mentioned that, that older couple. I did an interview with Matt with his yeah. trailer. And this couple is watching the interview. And 
they kind of, and then they came in after and he ends up showing them all the stuff. And it was, it was kind of funny because it's like, it was perfect for them. Was, what we're talking about is a little teardrop trailer. Yeah. And, and it was just perfect. They just absolutely fell in love with it. Right. But it was funny because I'm Matt's doing the interview and he's showing things and mm-hmm. that, and they're just sitting there watching him do his little thing. And then they had a couple of questions after they went up and talked to him and that. But it, what I found really interesting, I got there, I don't know, noon or something like that. And it took me seriously an hour to get past three vehicles because I'm talking yeah. to people, right? You know, I'm talking to Terry Ann, I'm talking to Mike and all these other, you know, and then Richard from, from Freedom Recovery Gear, I'm talking to him about, you know, some association stuff and some other recovery gear related stuff. And then it's an hour gone by. And I'm sure, mm-hmm. Treasure, you saw that at the Overland North too, right? Like, yep. He's like, oh yeah, I got I got to do some interviews or some video well, here because yeah, I'm just spending an hour past. talking. Exactly, or <laughs> talking and looking at rigs. You're like, oh man, I got to go on the other side. <laughs> like, there's a whole other <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like I saw, I saw you there, and and uh, I think you were talking to people and that, and that. But it was just, yeah, it was just funny because I I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna come here. I'm gonna get all these interviews and I'm gonna get all this coverage. And I'm looking back and like, I got three interviews. I did nothing. Right. You know, <laughs> but it was just, it was fun. And that's what it's about. You know, yeah. it's more, you know, for the, the community, like we're talking about earlier. Right. Yeah. So, and, and Toyota was fantastic mm-hmm. to offer up that prime, prime piece of real estate oh, for us yeah. to set up on. Yeah. And they're in it again next year. They're, they're already like, yep, we're, we want to do this again. And hopefully it'll just get bigger. Uh, good. Tell them they need to get a Tacoma. Yeah. <laughs> Trail well, under, yeah. <laughs> so by then, so Bill, one of our buddies, he's got a the third gen forerunner. You you would have met him. Yeah. He camped over beside yeah. me that night. And uh, so he's already got his name on the list. <laughs> so he's been waiting for the new Tacoma to come out. And then they came out with a trail hunter and he's like, that's it checks all the boxes. Yep. And it's going to be at Expo in two weeks so you'll nice actually physically see it in two weeks and the minute cool. the order banks open up he'll be placing an order so we'll we'll have one there one way or another <laughs> nice toyota did a great job and they did. it worked out yeah. good because there was also something else happening across the street right so yeah the radio <laughs> <laughs> but it was really neat because you want you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you see all these vehicles with rooftop temps all popped up and it was quite a visual thing from the mm-hmm. road and yeah. i think we gained a lot of people walking in just because of that as well yeah and then of course saturday night was absolutely great sitting around and, and eating and around the campfire and all that so yeah it was it was a good time you, you guys all did a great job it was really good so one of the second to last questions i guess we'll make that is while we're sitting up there camping or sitting there eating in that you brought out some of your new knives that you just mm-hmm. bought from a gentleman. And I was definitely mm-hmm. impressed with him. Let's just throw him a quick little plug because the quality of his handmade knives was just incredible. Yeah. So he was actually at the meet and greet as well. Okay. Set up with, he was in the corner with his dad. His dad has a red Jeep. So it's a good guy. <laughs> so his name's Brock and he's ex military, young guy who has fought for our country. And, you know, he started this, it's called Everett Edge, is his Instagram. And he started making these knives. I think he started out kind of making them for some of his buddies from the military. And it kind of just, I, I don't even remember how I heard about it. He's, I do remember. He sent me a message on Instagram and it was a piece of red and white resin. And he said, this would look great in your Jeep. Good guy, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's smart. Yeah, and I kind of like, yeah, that's kind of cool. I never thought anything of it. And it was actually one night... My wife and I are sitting on the couch watching TV and he sent it to me and he goes, he had like a design of a kitchen knife. And, and then that was done. It was, it, and that is truly that piece of resin is beautiful. And the knife is beautiful, all handmade. Um, mm-hmm. He, he is recently actually started doing it full time. Good so for him. He's, yeah. he's moved on to these. And again, he's a young guy and, and it's great to support a local. He's in Kamloops local business and yep. someone again who's who's fought for our country or you know other countries yeah. and i've got you know i you're coming on next thursday so i have somebody else who's getting one and then bill <laughs> he got one and then bill got another one for his son for his birthday and so i mean we're kind of all all in on brock and his business so great yeah and what's, his, other, uh, what's uh, his instagram again everett edge 
Go, we right will uh, check them out. We'll throw him in show notes as well, too. Cr- so our last question that we ask all our guests is, what Canadian would you like to listen to on the 4x4 Canada podcast? So I, I have a couple here uh-huh. because I listened to your podcast. So I, <laughs> I knew this question was coming up and I've heard some of the names that have been brought up. So I actually had Brock on my list. And I know he's not an overlander and, and that kind of thing, but he's in a way he's supporting kind of that overland four by four worlds and he's an outdoorsman. He's an outdoors guy. And I think he would have a very interesting story on how he got his business going and, yeah. and you know, whatever he's would want to talk about. So I can send you his actual Instagram. And then I had two others and one you've talked about, and that's Matt from Exploration Overland. Mm-hmm. I think he would make a, he's a funny guy. He is one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. He works five, six days a week and it is day job, which I believe is heavy duty mechanics. He's got three trucks and comes home. He's got four kids. <laughs> he only had two of them there at the meet and greet. He was four. And when they go to bed, he goes out and spends four hours a night working on building trailers, oh. these teardrop trailers. And he's, he's just, He's just a nice person. He's a great yeah. family guy. And and I think just he would be a fun, fun interview for sure. I agree for sure. He's definitely on the list. And, you know, just to give people an idea, we did talk to him. If you go back to our YouTube channel and I did do a quick video interview with Matt on his teared up trailer. So you can see what we're talking about, but I definitely want to get him back on the first mm-hmm. full episode because I think he's a neat guy. He's a, like I say, he's a fun guy and. Yeah. Just a hard worker, and he's got a great product for a good price. And that's yes. basically what he's been been pushing. He goes, you know, he's, I just need to make my money and Yeah. He's you know, very I, talented. Yes. He he's very talented. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, and then my last one, and you're going to you're going to the BC Overland rally mm-hmm. would be Ray. Yes. Yeah. Like I think he from especially from the West, and he's traveled around the world, him and his wife, and to have both of them on. I don't know if you can yeah. do that, but they would be a very fun interview because they've had so much experience in the overland world, like literally they have. The world. So, yes. I did send him an email a couple of weeks ago, but I think it was just too tight in timelines with his event in Washington here last week yeah. and yeah. then stuff like that. So I would actually like to get him on before the overland Act rally, but I don't think that's going to happen just because he's got so much on the go, but you're right. He, I listened to a podcast that he did. I, I think it might have been with, I can't remember actually who it was with, but yeah, they where they talked about where they traveled around the world in their Land Rover. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, just a really, really interesting story. Is, yeah. yeah, I definitely I think that like, was the over, Overland Journal. I podcast, think it was. I yeah, I think yeah. with Scott Brady and, and that. Yeah, yeah it, it was just, it was a really, really great story. You know, I'm listening to it and I'm like, wow, I, I can't believe I've never actually met the guy and, you know, he's right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. It almost 100%. made me want to get a defender and then, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, beautiful, Mike. I really want to thank you for uh, for coming on t- tonight. Again, we're talking to Mike from Okanagan, Okanagan Overlanding. And you can check him out on Instagram, Facebook, and the YouTube as well. Trisha, I want to thank you for staying up so late tonight. I know it's late over on your side of the country. <laughs> but uh, again, uh, check out Trisha's video. It will be released by time, or it will be up on YouTube by time this is released at uh, 404 Canada podcast on YouTube, where she hits up the Overland North for her first Overland event, not her last by sounds of it. So yeah. next time we'll maybe try and get her some video coverage and strap her into a race car or something like that. So, <laughs> But yeah, I want to thank both of you guys for coming on tonight. And again, what Mike will definitely hit each other up soon after you get back from your trip down to the States and yeah, for sure. try and get out for a night or two and do some camping and Sounds good. sitting around a campfire with a beer and we're all good. Yeah. <laughs> that's all it takes. We're simple, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 